This is the eighth in the 2022 lecture series of the Museo ng Kaalamang Katutubo. Welcome and a pleasant afternoon. We are delighted to see our faithful audience and to make the acquaintance of those who have only recently learned of Muscat's online programs. Your company gives us much delight and it is our hope that this afternoon will be a splendid experience for you. This afternoon, an extraordinary scholar will shed light on the intimate relationship between two disciplines vital in the building and nurturing of a nation, of a people, history and archaeology. Professor Dr. Victor J. Paz will argue that the disciplines of history and archaeology in the Philippines are interconnected and demonstrate how basic research in both archaeology and history improved our understanding of Philippine history while providing significant inputs in the formulation of a better periodization in the study of humankind in this archipelago. Dr. Paz will be more properly introduced later by Muscat colleague Raymond Santiago. In the meantime, first a brief introduction of us. Museo ng Kaalamang Katutubo or Muscat, especially for those who have just joined us. Muscat is a foundation engaged in museum development, collecting, studying, and safeguarding material culture and cultural education programs, with Unilab as its main benefactor. I am Corazon Alvina. The Museo ng Kaalamang Katutubo's mission and vision are about knowledge, ancestral and contemporary, Muscat is committed to rediscovering, recuperating, celebrating, and preserving Philippine inherited and transmitted kaalaman. Sharing knowledge is a good part of Muscat's work. We try to create the opportunities within which the public can discover, acknowledge, understand, and appreciate the many layers of Filipino kaalaman. Features of Philippine tangible and intangible culture are remarkable. Muscat's programs and projects are inspired by these. A keen custodian of tangible culture, Muscat's online presentations, programs, and publications with objects from the collection are conceptualized, mindful of careful research and ethical curatorship, maintaining the integrity of objects within the context particular to the source culture. To ensure correct scholarship, Muscat engages and collaborates with respected academics and acknowledged subject matter experts. There are processes that bring forth the most exquisite textile, the handsomest weapon, astonishing basketry. Muscat probes for the inspiration behind the creation of such culturally significant and aesthetically sound objects. Muscat is sensitive to the physicality and materiality of the objects themselves to guide the study of processes and technology and shepherd the conservation strategy for the well-being of the collection. Muscat has also operationalized collections management guidelines for registration and conservation. The bonds between humans and their environment and the balance that must be maintained between them receive the utmost regard from Muscat as do the aesthetic integrity and creative philosophy, the outstanding skills, and the commitment of our artists. Muscat acknowledges the diwa, spiritual sense and essence in Kaalaman. The resolve of the Museo ng Kaalamang Katutubo is to encourage, inspirit, and invigorate pride, admiration, and affection for Kaalamang Katutubo, as indeed for and in all things Philippine. Hi, Raymond. We promised earlier a more proper introduction of our esteemed speaker, Dr. Victor Paz. Do take the floor. Thank you, Ms. Cora, and good afternoon. Allow me to introduce our speaker for our session. Dr. Victor Joaquin Paz is a trained and actively engaged archaeologist. He received his bachelor's and master's degree in history 
in UP Diliman and went on to obtain another master's degree and doctorate in archaeology from Cambridge in the United Kingdom. His interest in general covers archaeology in Ireland, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. But his concentration these past few years were Southeast Asia and the Philippines, as well as similarly related fields in archaeobotany, public archaeology, and the materiality of consciousness. He maintains a multidisciplinary approach in his research projects. Dr. Pass teaches at the Archaeology Studies Program in UP Diliman. He has authored and co-authored several articles and studies contributing in major national and international journals since 2004 to the present. His active dig sites are in Palawan since 2002, Katanawan since 2008, Ba'i since 2013, and Agusan del Sur since 2014. Guiding students, working with peers, as well as collaborating with world-renowned experts in the field of archaeology. He is also the founding editor of Hukai, the ASP journal for archaeological research established in 1998 and was director of the Archaeological Studies Program from 2003 to 2012. Our speaker this afternoon, dear audience, no doubt is the leading expert in his field, and he will be sharing with us his insights on the topic, the intertwined practice of archaeology and history in the Philippines. Please note, there will be a Q&A portion after the talk, Please do send your inquiries and comments in the FP comment section, and we will take these up after the lecture. Now, without further ado, let me turn over the virtual floor to Dr. Pass. Thank you, Raymond. I hope this is the last virtual floor that we share uh, in the coming months or years. Uh, although it is very practical, it is, of course, uh, very limited. Um, I wish I could see uh, the faces of the people that I'm speaking to. But in this case, I will just have to imagine, which, of course, we are in archaeology and history, uh, do have a lot of uh, imagination. I um, thank you for the generous introduction. And as uh, you have um, heard, I. I am indeed um, also a historian. And if you scratch, I always say, if you scratch my skin hard enough, uh, historiography will come out and the basic historian is uh, very much uh, alive within me. And so I approach archeology span very much like uh, a classic historian, but uh, we are in the 21st century and decades of practice have distilled a lot of our um, thinking and our approaches to disciplinal studies. I was tasked really to um, to give a talk about archaeology and history, and uh, and uh, funny enough, it's one of those hobby horses I I do have, and I've been uh, uh, pondering upon uh, the real interconnection of of both. And so the talk for today is aptly titled Intertwined Praxis. Praxis, for those who are not familiar with that uh, term, is just theory and practice. And uh, archaeology is the study of the past, mainly based on material culture. History is a study of the past, but here's the rub, not based on written documents, which is a very narrow definition of history, but based on the totality of of approaches that we can use to study the human past. So it's a larger, it's a larger discipline and a much older discipline than archaeology. That may be a controversial definition, but that is our working definition for today. So I plan to do two things for uh, to try to outline 
why I think they are intertwined. And second, to go through a series of examples wherein it will focus on um, how archaeology, so it's not going to be in a sense uh, questions of archaeology being buttressed by history, but more uh, to drive the point uh, more, more aptly or more succinctly to see uh, problems in history that archaeological studies um, has um, helped uh, perhaps answer or at least um, advance knowledge regarding those um, wonderful conundrums in history. So let me all again uh, start with the statement that intertwined because, and this is a very big statement, we cannot really divorce history and archeology span uh, in um, the Philippines and in Southeast Asia. From the get-go, they were twins. They were Siamese twins. They were uh, attached to each other in its uh, actual practice. Even though on paper, in the literature, some you might be deceived to think that they are not, but they are. And they are indeed intertwined from the very beginning because the disciplines that are 19th century disciplines are uh, interested in um, time, in the, in, in the draw of time, in the march of time, and how people were interacting with other people, with cultures transform through this drawn of time. It's a central concern. And landscapes are always central as a specific context in all of this. To create a historical context, an archaeological context, landscapes, uh, be it the landscape of a culture's mind or the actual ge geographic landscape of different scales becomes the actual context of archaeology and history. Uh, added to this, archaeological studies uh, were framed from the get-go, from the early 20th century, one could even argue from the propaganda movement uh, in the late 19th century, they were always uh, couched or used or utilized or made as tools to uh, uh, support the narrative of the state or contemporary cultures at that time. And of course, uh, the understanding of cultures within, again, the framework of a state. So to demonstrate this, if you look at textbooks from the very beginning, of public school textbooks, starting with Benitez, or even before Benitez, um, starting with the Americans, uh, but Benitez was the first Filipino uh, written textbook, you will see that the outline will always have as a backdrop geography. And part of that geography backdrop is the so-called pre-Spanish period a big chunk of time um, distilled in a few pages because there was so little known and people were very hungry to find out more. And, uh, and so the people did a lot um, to try to expand what, what we can say about things that took place in the islands prior to the 16th century. Uh, some to uh, an excess, like uh, what happened to the Kodro Kalanchao, uh, all those um, spurious documents that, that were passed as, uh, as real documents in the 1950s, but uh, most really uh, at the end uh, relied on archeology, span uh, even though in a limited sense. So here alone is a, a good demonstration of how for history, archeology span is it's like uh, the incipient stage of its of its narrative, it's always to be, uh, be there, but treated more like geography, you know, like the backdrop of mostly a state or a nation state history uh, or the history of contemporary cultures. Now, from the, from the standpoint of archeology, span it has uh, tried to create typologies, chronologies uh, since the first synthesis before the second world war, finally published in the 19, late 1940s by Otley Beyer, uh, where they were just, he was just filling up you know, like um, um, pigeonholes that uh, of 
periods of typologies that he, he, he uh, adopted from Europe. And then with more data coming from the field, from the National Museum, from the 19, uh, late 50s to early 60s, the more data that was uh, generated with good context, the, this periodization became more problematic but simplified. Uh, so much so that uh, today, after the synthesis of the 1980s, where there was a, a kind of unified uh, thinking of how, how to periodize Philippine archaeology, there is still there is no consensus at the moment. Unfortunately, we're in the middle of trying to create a consensus. But there is a commonality across all of this. It is attached like an umbilical cord to the periodization of history. Uh, in this case, it's either the porcelain age, the contact or trade, or uh, proto-historic, as they say, a, a very problematic term. Now, lastly, archaeology and history are heritage uh, disciplines. They are, as uh, mentioned earlier, beyond the nation state. It is uh, definitely a, uh, a concern and an interest of these two disciplines to study the totality of the human past. And the difference now from driven by the nation state interests or a specific culture, uh, heritage, archeology span and, and history are united in its uh, valuing of materiality of culture. Material, and this materiality can take the form of, of mo mo movable objects, down to buildings, down to uh, landscapes, um, modified or natural, all of these become part of heritage materiality because it is given value by people. And once it's given by value by people, then it becomes part of its heritage, that people's heritage. So, while as a caveat, while archaeology in the Philippines really technically formally started from anthropology, uh, from the get go, as I will mention, as I mentioned earlier, the 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 person who drove and almost single handedly uh, advanced this discipline up to the night up to the post war years, the late nineteen forties, was concerned with chronology, was concerned with typology was concerned more with materiality of culture rather than trying to, uh, and I, th I think he just didn't have time. And there was so much to do and so much to cover that he, he, did not, he didn't have time to look at the more intricate questions of culture change internally or the nature of culture full stop at any given time. And uh, to demonstrate this, when he was given a chance to really sh uh, showcase archaeology and the synthesis of archaeology, the first and most popular one, 1947, was a comic book a collaboration uh, with collaboration with a very senior historian of that day, Jaime de Vieira, uh, much senior than him, in fact. He's, uh, he, he was older when they wrote this. And he uh, wrote the first part until the coming of Magellan. And de Vieira wrote Magellan to the post-war years. So uh, a classic, so much so that when this came out, immediately the evening news uh, uh, had to reprint it because of uh, popular demand. And I will argue that this is a reason, this very comic, this um, what, I, what is now called um, graphic novel, <laughs> is the reason why the waves of migration is still with us. It's embedded in the consciousness of people uh, because it's still being, uh, inst uh, instructions are still uh, earnest in, in the school system. Uh, I doubt that totally, but because it has, uh, it's embedded in the consciousness of the educated elite across the Philippine archipelago. At this stage, let me now share a couple of examples of what we mean by this intertwinedness uh, uh, in real terms. Uh, let's start with a very interesting question. Were, were the Spaniards, were the conquistadors, the missionaries, were they uh, doing their uh, um, evangelization 
and when they created their um, their uh, reductions, no, their pueblos, were they following the same pattern as they did in South America? Where what they did was they plunk their uh, ritual space, their churches, on top of older ritual spaces of the locals, and so we doubted this a bit because we couldn't find we can demonstrate it in many of uh, previous excavations, but we assumed that it was. But in Panatungan, a very sleepy uh, part of Placer by the coast, uh, almost erased uh, after, the, after the slave raids of the early 19th century, it was so significant, it was in the maps for a long time. Then it disappeared because of a large uh, slave raiding uh, episode that uh, practically uh, eradicated the place. Then fast forward, uh, an excavation was done uh, in the early 90s. And in that excavation, uh, two uh, cultural layers were established, or two burial types, uh, at a, uh, a very early one around 140 current era, and a 60th, 70th century current era uh, burial layer. And they are different ways of burying their dead, uh, as you can see in the image. But what is in interesting here, and there are many, many burials, that all the burials were within the walls that were created, which was inferred to be a chapel, or at least a visita, of Panputunga at the beginning. And none were found outside the walls. Indeed, the inference that we can place here is that uh, the people who were creating those that walled chapel uh, were aware of the boundaries of a landscape that was meaningful to the people who were there before they were converted to Christianity. And then that's where they placed their chapel or their church at that time. Well, so much so that not a single old burial could be found outside the boundaries of this later chapel. So that can be a, a wonderful uh, demonstration of an example, but not really the, maybe an exception of how uh, early uh, missionaries were uh, uh, placing their churches in older settlements. And in this case, it was a settlement where the reduction happened just within, nearby you know, the older settlement. Uh, and it was not, they were not really moved far away from their original place of settlement. The other example, uh, which is very important, is what is the nature of settlements really prior to the coming of the Spaniards? And um, uh, and is rise that significant really uh, by th this period, by the last thousand years or so? And uh, did they really bury their dead underneath or near their houses? As uh, we know from folklore or from um, narratives of uh, contemporary cultures. And in Porak Pampanga, which is really at the very top of the river, no? it's not, it's far from the sea, it is more closer to the headlands near Pinatubo. There's a plateau no, in the Sporak River uh, called Babo Balukbok. And there we find, we demonstrated that there's a large settlement there excavated by Robert Fox in the late 50s, early 60s by the National Museum and then by the ASP in the early not years. And here, but this time we went big time and we opened up a large space and we demonstrated that it is indeed a settlement. It has domestic debris, it has hearts, uh, it has uh, post salt patterns, uh, uh, and uh, it has uh, middens, no? uh, uh, several middens that we excavated, and all within a 24 to 22 meter area. So within this area, we could establish at least uh, four contemporary features, mostly maybe two houses and two granaries, and one much later, uh, around 16th uh, century uh, feature. And they, indeed, they buried their dead next to their settlement or within their settlement. And on top of it was a demonstration that there was rice, uh, and they were indeed uh, utilizing, most likely cultivating rice, most likely because we exposed the fields that uh, could only be uh, fields for rice cultivation, contemporary to the 1600s, you know, 16th century. And so you have 
four early set uh, features, you have a later feature, and then you have all these burials next to them, right? And then you have that later burial, and then you have a heart there, two hearts, where in both hearts, one older, one younger, both radiocarbon dated, you have remains of, charred remains of rice. Now, Manila is an interesting example. We always thought that Manila, when the, when the, when the Gaspi came and the Battle of Manila, that Manila, especially in the 19th century, is more or less the way we see it now. But, but that's wrong. Manila has always been swampy. And Manila, and as we now know and conclude, was an active river delta even up to the 19th century. And how did we come up with that conclusion? Well, we kept on digging in Manila, you know, uh, and by our fourth excavation, we were we had a problem. We could not locate older archaeology, older than the Spanish period, older than the 16th century, and that was uh, a problem. And we were already excavating in um, San Agustin and in uh, uh, just along within uh, within uh, Intramuros itself. And the only place where we found older archaeology was in Santa Ana. So what's happening here? So after more excavations across Manila, we can conclude and we can create a, a new uh, framework, a new thinking about Manila and how we can define it. So I see it really as we can define Manila best, more uh, app if we see it as a habitation landscape relationship through time, where it is uh, dictated by the formation of the river delta, and where and how the river delta develop uh, dictates uh, the periods of its history, its human history, and of course the changing landscape uh, also dictates that there are places where the archaeology or human presence is young, and there are places where human presence is old. So if we take that, uh, we see that uh, to the mountains, we have older archaeology. Nearer the sea, we have younger archaeology. And you will find that the Pasig River is within the younger uh, period, more or less. And so pre-Manila will be when the entire place didn't exist, and there was a big sound that connects Manila Bay and uh, Laguna Lake. And we know this because we can even pinpoint roughly geologically that around 6,000 years ago or so, uh, Laguna Lake starts becoming fresh water uh, rather than brackish or salt water. That means that the space between the bay and the lake has been plugged and Laguna Lake now becomes more fresh water. So this is the start of the landscape formation. Then you will have the first deltas around the Pasig uh, area, no? at the mouth of uh, near Laguna Lake. And then that delta will grow and grow and grow, and the river will grow until it reaches where it is now. Now, the other thing is uh, this, this process of growth of this alluvial plane, of this creation of this wide fan of river delta uh, landscape is complicated but accelerated by the existence of other uh, rivers where we can see that there are many esteros that are perpendicular to the Pasig River. If these were delta rivulets, they will not be perpendicular, right? There will be a, 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 a either, there will be in a certain angle, right? Like a, a um, herringbone angle towards the river, uh, towards the sea. But here there are many perpendicular esteros which tells us there are other sources of water that were in, um, in sediments that was filling in the Manila area. So the earliest Manila will be islands of uh, Pasig and Taguig. And then the next will be islands that uh, will include Tondo and Santa Ana. And here we can use historical documents. Well, one singular, very famous one, the Laguna Copper Plate, where it indicates the existence of Tondo, at least. And then, of course, Manila leading to 1571, where the sea was lapping uh, just by the walls or the early walls of Intramuros. Now, mind you, all these boxes you see are archaeological excavations that we've done or done by Otley Bayer and others. 
And the area where you, you see San Marcelino, you know, by the Pasig River, all of this area was still very swampy. It's very swampy even up to the early 20th century. And we think that Manila was an island by this time, but a very limited island within what is now uh, Intramuros. So that is a general estimate. And it is being of refined as the more we excavate around Intramuros. So then Manila as Intramuros is uh, uh, straightforward. And then of course, Manila, Manila as the expanding metropolis and that is the Manila that we know today. So that is informed by archeology span and with all the other disciplines at toe. Now across the bay is an interesting uh, small question. If, uh, but there are no more perhaps uh, people who are alive, but if you were born before the Second World War and you were, and you were conscious, you will know that Cavite and Cavite City, Cavite Viero, was like a small intramuros. It was a wall, it was highly structured, it was a big, very important uh, uh, fortified city of the Spaniards. But the war destroyed it totally, so much so that it was bombed and bulldozed. And if you were uh, alive in the 1950s, you won't even have memory of its structures. What you will see will be just an open space, what is now um, uh, uh, Samonte Park. No? And within this open space are the remains of, uh, of Cavite. Yeah. And uh, now we, can, we have demonstrated through excavations uh, exactly where Porto Vaga is, where, where the entrance to this large complex, this mini Intramuros, is located within some of the park. Setting, setting the, 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 the stage for any future Cavite archaeologist or heritage advocate to slowly, slowly re-excavate or expose or integrate the remains of this uh, very important um, city and structure with the uh, with heritage of Cavite City. Now, going to uh, Cebu, uh, we see uh, Fort San Pedro, and there's nothing uh, special about Fort San Pedro archaeologically, except that we know historically it is the oldest fort, really, the really oldest, the, the center, epicenter of colonialism, where Legazpi stayed and settled and, and fortified the place. So we will think that around Fort San Pedro and Cebu City, they will be highly Christianized uh, very early on. But uh, excavations just outside the fort, right? When they were making that uh, overpass, uh, it was an impact assessment, uh, revealed a burial of a young woman that was murdered, had marks around its uh, arms, no, it was, uh, it died a violent death. But what's intriguing is that its head was transformed. So it has a modified head to take that very, very old prestige head form that we see across the Visayas and Mindanao, uh, almost conical. And this burial is, is definitely established to be younger than the established walls of Fort San Pedro. So at the heart of Cebu City, people around C Fort San Pedro were still living their lives, still had this concept of prestige that was definitely pre-Christian. Now, very specific, we can even um, them, um, contribute to events, but in a very na narrow way, uh, take uh, the Philippine-American War where in the Battle of uh, San Mateo, where Lawton was killed, uh, and this is published in work of Aya uh, and, and company, uh, they've uh, demonstrated that the trenches, the Philippine, trench, the Philippine army trenches are still there. Luckily, because this is such a floodplain, no one lives in those floodplains, but they have located at least the remains of three of these uh, Philippine-American war trenches waiting to be further investigated uh, during the dry season. Now, we had a big project in Mindoro. And in Mindoro, we were looking for Mayi. 
At the same time, we were trying to answer that earlier question we did uh, try to answer in Panutungan, uh, where, where the, where the uh, missionaries building churches, stone churches, on top of uh, ritual spaces of the older um, cultures. In Mindoro, it wasn't the case. They were creating their pueblos uh, outside after the reduction in new places and not in plunking it in older settlement areas. And so we demonstrated that in at least four places. On top of that, of course, uh, there were many folklore, but the folklore is all about ruined churches because the current population of Mindoro are settlers and they're either Visayans or Tagalogs. And so when they came, those churches were already ruins. And so all their folklores are about churches that were not finished, uh, were built by, by giants, by supernatural creatures, and they were not completed. They were always incomplete. But what's important here is not that at the moment. We could not find evidence of Mai. So that old, where everyone from Jose Rizal claimed to be Mindoro, is something that we uh, seriously question now. And we seriously uh, uh, entertain the idea, the hypothesis that Mai is along Laguna Lake. And this is because aside from independently of the archaeological excavations and projects, there were two other scholars, no? uh, Gobonwan and Sincha Valdez, who came to the same conclusion independently. And Gobonwan uh, publishes his uh, argument very clearly no? uh, about it. And so since then, slowly we've been trying to look for more evidence of Mai, but it's not uh, difficult to find evidence because even before we started looking for evidence, there are other older projects already existing, such as um, the Pila project, which I will I'll go to earlier uh, later on. But we did excavate at Bayi and expose a, a site that's around 2,000 years old, you know, maybe a bit younger. And it's an interesting site because it's a jar burial site with a, a very unusual jar burial shape. Unfortunately, the sediment's very acidic, there are no more bones, etc. But this is an important site, but too old for Mayi. But then, as I mentioned, in the 1960s, there was a huge project uh, run by Rosas Danasas, uh, and, um, and they excavated uh, a, a crematorium and a huge cemetery, a settlement, uh, which really will uh, fit Mayi better than any of the archaeology we know so far in Mindoro. And on top of that, of course, was the recovery of the Laguna Copper Plate, just uh, further east or uh, off uh, Pila. So those are just a few examples of how we can use archaeology and history intertwined to enhance what we know about Philippine history, Philippine culture. But let me just say again that uh, history is not simply uh, about the study of uh, documents, written documents. The text for history, like in archaeology, has many forms. Uh, material culture is the most paramount one where it um, marries with the interests of archaeology. Uh, second, uh, chronology is central to both archaeology and history. We need to really be confident and really know the, the sequence of, uh, of events, uh, the process of how to understand it, to create our periodizations. And this is uh, where the problem lies. We still have no uh, very confident, uh, unanimous, uh, accepted by all uh, 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 approach to how to organize our deep past uh, from the beginnings of uh, humankind in the Philippine Islands up to the contemporary histories that we live in. And of course, uh, let us not forget that the disciplines of history and archaeology are 19th century constructs, but we are in the 21st century and we must embrace the idea that uh, the fusion, the, the confluence of these two disciplines is the default of the 21st century rather than an exception. 
And heritage is central to all of this because this is what gives meaning to why we are interested in all of this. There are many of uh, definitely um, specialists who are, will be interested in a very specific concern, but at the end, the larger pictures, the, mo the moment you go beyond a certain analysis of a certain object or certain assemblage or certain document, you will not be able to escape the draw or the framework of heritage. So that's all. I would be more than happy to answer questions. Oh, I think I, I spoke within time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Doc Pass, for a most interesting, informative, and actually a very fascinating subject matter this afternoon. Yeah. Um, uh, with your indulgence, Dr. Pass, uh, without further ado, uh, might we go on with the question and answer portion? Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Um, we are still waiting for questions from the audience, but uh, I've already one or two uh, here um, outlined. Uh, one, one colleague from Muscat asks, uh, in your uh, archaeological excavations, Doc, um, did they run or did you run into traces of the natural environment, uh, tree stumps, for instance? Uh, the way that material proof of uh, plowing was uh, uncovered. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's uh, quite common. Natural um, natural features, as we say, are are more common than than um, one might think. Uh, they come from small uh, earthworm uh, cavities down to. Um, tree trunks uh, or cavities left by up uprooted uh, um, root systems. Uh, yes, no, that's, um, and of course, cracks in the, sometimes you, you have dry sediments and then it cracks and then, uh, and worse, if you have an earthquake, the cracks are big and then they get infilled. If you are not um, very careful in excavating or you're not, um, um, well trained, perhaps, or, or well experienced, you will not see all of this. Uh, but luckily, through the years uh, in our system of recording, it is um, uh, these things don't escape us. With plowing, that's very rare. The one I shared is the only direct evidence we have of plowing uh, in the entire country. You know, in Japan they have more. And in China, they have more evidence, but I'm confident in the future we will find more. Okay. Look, what what initially comes to mind is that um, uh, in your resume, one of your early interests was uh, archaeobotany, mm -hmm. and uh, I suppose there's a lot of um, uh, of the discipline of archaeobotany that comes into play uh, uh, because largely you uh, you employ a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, to your, I uh, know, uh, how, how, how has that uh, uh, worked out for you? I mean, uh, how, what is the state of the uh, archaeobotany uh, study or discipline uh, within uh, the practice of archaeology? It is, much, it is much better than uh, three decades ago, uh, but there's still much to do. Um, the thing is, um, archaeobotany is not as sexy as other uh, sub, <laughs> sub archaeology and mm -hmm. um, and but the the questions are still very very um relevant uh as, especially because we are interested in um re resiliency we are in, interested in uh, larger patterns uh hoping that uh we find you know we, we learn from we learn from all of this uh so um uh, but uh, even when, uh, for example, I'll just give you an example. That I hope I can do it uh, very shortly. Uh, the idea that um, that we are rice, um, that rice agriculture and, ri and, and rice and cereals are, are the only agriculture that exists 
that that was relevant in the Philippine Islands and, and Islands of the Asian Pacific. Uh, we don't subscribe to that anymore, no? Mm. And we think that rice, uh, in my thinking, and I'm not alone, uh, first and foremost, uh, 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 got embedded in our ancestral cultures, but while it was being embedded, there was a different kind of farming agriculture that was more based on root crops, uh, trees, you know, fruits, nuts, no? and this is really um, something that was managed and managed well. You know, one can argue really that it is agriculture, and then, but then you have a shift in worldview in cosmology. And that is clearly by the 16th century, by maybe even by the 15th century, or maybe even by the 10th century, you will see now rice-based uh, cultures, mentality dominating. But still, it was not the staple because it was a prestige good. So rice, as like we are all now cunning boys and girls, mm. uh, is a phenomenon <laughs> of... Uh, maybe the late 19th century in my thinking okay. where people can eat rice day in and day out no. but that's that's not the case most of the time okay so that's something that archibotany uh can address you know, even up to now okay thank you doc uh we have, we've um you have a lot of questions now um from antonette mercado doc uh, good afternoon. I would like to ask how did archaeology affect the architecture of the Philippines with respect to history? Well, uh, if, if, uh, if what she meant was the architecture, uh, actual architecture, like uh, built structures, uh, hardly, except for several places where, uh, where the state intervened and created uh, special um, reserves. No? For instance, um, the Lipon Point in Tabon, where the state intervened, made it a reserve, the National Museum intervened and created a, a park uh, revolving around archeological sites. In Butuan, no? in uh, Agusan del Norte is another example. And then uh, with comes to churches, one might, argue that archaeology only has uh, a slight uh, uh, influence there. Uh, it is really more in the domain of the National Historical Commission and of uh, historians and, and heritage architects. And archaeology only comes into play when uh, they have to dig or they uh, accidentally excavated a burial. But build structures, more or less, are not too much uh, influenced by by archaeology. archaeology. So, yeah. Okay, we have a related question from Chelsea K. Marquez Mara. Uh, how do you determine if a site uh, has uh, archaeological or historical significance? Do you also conduct uh, cultural mapping or ethnographic research before doing an excavation? I suppose a preparatory um uh, uh yeah. initiative depends if you have if you have a research design then you what you do is you try to look for the best sites to to best uh, uh, potentially answer your research questions so in that case you go and and wander around the landscape you know, and then you ask questions uh, most of the time it is because of um expediency and people report it right or there's a development going on and then we have to do something about it so we have to do a rescue archaeology a lot of the sites that we i showed you in manila is because of a law that uh, requires um, large projects of uh, building projects to have an archaeological impact assessment so without that people are actually not uh, bothered no? to follow uh, or to look for archaeological sites. So, so there. Are, so the short answer is, uh, have mo most of the time it's because of what is reported or what's already out there, and for the tiny fraction that's uh, uh, found because of research design, 
um, that that is because the archaeologist or the archaeology team is looking for a specific kind of of site. I'll give you an example. If you're looking for Homo erectus or, or a new hominid like Homo lucinensis, you will go and look for it at a certain kind of landscape. The last place you will go will be an alluvial plain like Manila. So you will go in, lime, in high, higher altitude limestone um, caves with sediments that are thick, hoping that that's enough sediment to bring you back to uh, 100,000 years or so, right? Or even 75,000 years. So that's something that's, um, that's deliberate in that sense. But in, in my case, I am interested in all. And what, what, what really, what an archeologist wants is a site with many, many um, faces of human, um, human presence uh, to show the changes through time of human behavior or human, at least material culture uh, uh, expressions or, or byproducts. So that's, that's the best site. No? That's a better site than a single you know, a place where you only have one kind of archeology. span Okay, thank you, Doc. Um, from Jose Reynaldo Humacchio Nascienceno. Wow. Um, how big was the Kingdom of Tondo? Okay, well, we think it is um, bounded by the uh, the uh, what do you call it the sandbar that created that where Tondo was. You know? So imagine it as a river delta island. So if you can imagine a river, and in any mouth of the river, there's always islands, right? So imagine that. So Tondo was one of those river, early river islands. And that's where the Tondo settlement was. Kingdom as a term may be uh, misleading. And so the, the, the easiest or the safest term to use is polity. Because with kingdom, there are many uh, things that we, um, assume should be present um, and a, a kind of uh, social structuring that we we don't think existed in this part of the world but definitely it was a, a structured society with a uh, a big man no? and that person was ruling this polity that was influential maybe because it was at that time at a very uh, um, uh, gates of of the river uh, of the Pasig River at any given time. Yeah. Look, um, another question: uh, Your periodization of history and archaeology as nineteenth-century uh, constructs is that only for the Philippines? Uh, as history was alive uh, early on in the West. Hmm. Yes, but the history that we know of, the technical history that is disciplinal, is really 19th century. So the earlier histories are, yes, indeed, there, you know, back to Herodotus and, and, uh, and the ancient Greeks. But the, uh, the, the rigor that we call that, that's uh, connected to the discipline of history is from Leopold Ranke, the German uh, historian down up to the early 20th century. So that is, uh, but uh, let me just clarify there that what, what I mean is that this kind of uh, disciplinal approach are really limited uh, or, and created uh, high walls uh, against other disciplines and they were very rigorous and uh, and and they and they had this uh, you know, rigor that um, that really defines them and uh, unfortunately in the process uh, a lot of naval gazing happens because you don't look beyond the, the tall walls no and um, and that is uh, in many ways had advantages but in the long run it has disadvantages and we getting all of these disciplines in the 20th century, in the late 20th century, to be more precise, uh, we, uh, it is, we are better off really to think that we are, practicer, uh, we are practitioners in the 21st century, where, where even in the middle of the 20th century, 
the call of everyone who is into a deeper understanding of, of, of knowledge, of pushing the boundaries of knowability, is to be able to look at things in a multi and interdisciplinary approach. Multidisciplinary is what I've been doing, but the holy grail is interdiscipline, where there are no more boundaries, the boundaries of disciplines are low, and the questions asked are truly constructed, generated, not from one discipline, but from several at the same time. So for instance, when I say, when I gave those examples, the questions were historical questions. And then archeology span was trying to uh, elucidate, uh, or try to answer those historical questions. And then the geneticists are very, uh, very uh, popular about, at the beginning of, pop of population genetics, they were getting archeological and linguistic questions and they're trying to answer them from genetics. So in the future, there will be questions that you can really pinpoint exactly in what discipline it belongs to. That is the telltale sign that we are indeed closer or maybe practicing interdisciplinary uh, research. So research is the question here now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dom. Um, from Adam Down. Uh, hello, Dr. Pass. Thanks for the talk. You mentioned battlefield archaeology, which is going to be my future. Oh, okay. Uh, what scope is there uh, at this stage for practicing uh, battlefield archaeology in the Philippines? Well, it's an open field. There's really, a, after that, that short, cute paper by Aya and company, it was never followed up. But what I like about it, it showed that it is possible. No? So we're talking about events that happened uh, over a hundred years ago. And then there are many more events that may be, so the thing with battlefield archeology, span it's event centered. So it's more difficult, but there are, if you can, uh, well, another classic example, which I forgot, but it's for all intents and purposes is battlefield archeology span is the excavation of the San Diego shipwreck because the San Diego shipwreck uh, sunk in the middle of a naval battle. And uh, that, uh, in a way, is a battlefield, uh, um, an example of a battlefield archaeology. But my, my advice is to learn uh, metal detecting and to learn it well and to learn it, to use it systematically within the purview of archaeological methodology. Uh, that would be the best approach for battlefield archaeology anywhere in the world, but especially in the Philippines. Yeah. Thank you, Doc. Uh, from Joe Peters, uh, is the evidence evident and enough to say it was a policy of old religious sites uh, to uh, build over uh, uh, by what I presume is, you said modern churches? On the contrary, I don't think it was policy. I think it was the exception. Uh, we've been reading about this secondhand from research coming out from South America, that that was the policy at the early parts of the, conquist, the, uh, of the conquista. But in the Philippines, uh, I don't think it was policy at all. No. So it depended, um, and mind you, like, let's take uh, Panutungan. Panutungan, that church might, must have been built only in the early 19th century. So it wasn't that old. No? So because the reduction and the, um, the uh, conversion of a lot of uh, the communities in Eastern Mindanao took place much later than in Luzon or in the uh, northern part of Central Visayas or Central uh, Philippines. So it will depend on the missionary no? and, and the zeal of the missionary, uh, really. But uh, so, yes, so short answer is that no, it's not policy. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, another uh, follow through question from the plowing. Uh, would the proof of plowing the contempor be contemporary with the introduction of uh, Arado? Arado, I mean, I mean Arado, this yeah. Arado. Arado, uh, yeah, Arado, yes. Uh, uh, during the coming of the Spaniards. I think. Uh, 
that uh, Darado, yes, um, uh, will come with the Spanish, but I think there was a, a version of it, an earlier version of it, uh, which uh, was kicking around. But you see, with that, we'll have to have evidence of beasts of burdens. And that's the other thing. No, they, they all that, they don't, they don't all come at the same time. No? They be just based on what we have, we have. No? So, and this is uh, the other thing. We're, we're dealing with um, to have a rado and to have um, uh, fields that are, are plowed. Uh, then this is usually uh, wet rice agriculture. But really, uh, a lot of the agriculture that we know that's more, that's older and more widespread, I think, are the dry or the upland, uh, uh, the kainin type uh, of, of rice um, uh, planting. And uh, wet rice at a large scale will indicate that, um, aside from prestige, that the community was capable of feeding itself with rice. But that is also not straightforward. It can be simply that whoever was in command or in control or owns all those rice fields and its produce has more power than ever than any other person in that community. So it's still very tricky and the evidence is still very flimsy. What is only different now in our thinking, we do not assume that rice was the staple, mm -hmm. and we do not assume that it has been um, dominant uh, for the last 4,000 years. Yeah. No. Thank you, Doc. Um, we have a comment and a question here from one of our trustees, Ma'am Feliz Prudente Santa Maria. Hello. Uh, excellent examples to explain the intertwining with which we personally agree. Thank you, Dr. Paz. Thank you. Her, her question is, um, what online or printed sources uh, is best to update us on Philippine history that incorporates archaeological conclusions and best conjectures? Uh, could Muscat share your reading list, perhaps? That is, um, yes, indeed, uh, of course. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know of any online resource where everything's there. But um, I, have, um, I have something that I, I promise um, caught up uh, and I'm writing it. Um, and yes, um, I'm always copy left. No, I'm not copyright. So <laughs> everything can be shared. No problem with that. And, um, but luckily with, uh, with many of this literature and, th and because I was prodded to write this for Muscat, for this piece that's big, becoming too big, uh, I've update, I'm, I'm now updated with, with the literature, especially with, with agriculture, with uh, food plants, um, old food plants, et cetera. Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I could be of some help there no? and uh, to, to pinpoint the latest literature out there, no? um, at least the summaries, if not the primary research. We'd be happy to post your reading list, yeah. though. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, look, uh, a, a few more questions from Fernando Villarca Cao. Uh, hmm. Given the particular perspectives your archaeological findings have afforded you, what are the historical narratives that may now be rightfully considered as fallacies? Aside, of course, from the fanciful theories of uh, Otli Bayer. Ah, but you, you know, fair, we have to be uh, more. Um... Uh, forgiving of Otley Bayer, no? you know, his demic diffusion is still with us. Uh, the idea of diffusion is still really the mechanism behind the Austronesian dispersal. No? But it, it is more, uh, but of course, there are no more waves and waves and waves mm -hmm. of, of migration. Oh, that's the only difference. The uh, fanciful uh, ideas in the past will be the Kodo Kalancha, of course, but that has already been a uh, slave by uh, 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 William Henry Scott in his dissertation at the USD back in 1965. No? So he has demonstrated that they were uh, forgeries or at least they were fakes. But what is interesting about that was everyone, all, all the scholars were, were thirsty. They were waiting, they were waiting and they wanted it to be, to be true. You know? so, it was, it, so the conditions back then, uh, made them want to believe it. 
no different uh, the same uh, psychology with the built down man no uh, back uh, when when it was fake and it was said it was the missing link etc so you human human communities are are uh, interesting that way uh, what else um i suppose uh, well the other thing is that although we are rice driven rice agriculturalists rice centered everything our ethno linguistic groups our culture uh, we must not think that ancestral filipinos were also the same uh, third that uh, well now that we we we've uncovered direct evidence of hominids in the Cagayan Valley and Luzon has always been an island and this small this diminutive creature of uh, homo luzonensis uh, got to Luzon that means that uh, we have to um, accept the fact that maritime technology may have been um, advanced enough for people to be able to cross larger bodies of water uh, and, and even hominids can do that. So there's an assumption here and, and that ancestors of the same species were idiots. No? It's, it's, it's called the, uh, the <laughs> sapien paradox, you know, like uh, there's nothing changing for a long time. And then, then all of a sudden, there's, in the last 5,000 years, there was massive change and transformation culture. That's not true anymore. It just so happens that we we know less, and therefore we create simpler narratives of of how people live back then. Okay. Uh, thank you, Doc. Uh, another question from Kenneth Pangilinan: Could infrastructure developments have destroyed some, uh, if not a lot, of uh, the archaeological settlements in Metro Manila? Oh yes, indeed. Oh, definitely. No, there's no question about it. But there's also, I'll give you, a, I know this is something that if you ask me where older settlements are in Metro Manila, it will be in that nice hilly part where you have the North Cemetery, La Loma, and the Chinese Cemetery. That would have been a perfect place for a huge settlement. But they've been cemeteries for a long time. And I don't think, uh, and they've been digging six, uh, six feet deep uh, into the ground. And so chances are there will be nothing left there. The other thing is that, um, of, you know, development is not bad. And many, many developments can actually save archaeological sites. Uh, one example would be if a building was built and you created a foundation, let's say a, a, a cement floor, and that building existed for 100 years or 50 years. Then that means everything underneath it is capped and saved for future uh, potential excavations. So not everything. So what's important is once excavate once uh, developments happen, it's it's only we can convince developers that uh, what we, we are just interested in recording uh, and recording and recording as fast as we can and saving as fast as we can, whatever we can save in terms of information, data and material. Yes, so that's a that's a mixed bag, uh, development and... So I take it you're not necessarily um, uh, a no infrastructure or anti-development advocate? I am not, oh, definitely, I am not. No? I am more for, uh, if let's just follow, you know, you know the, the spirit of the law is very clear. If only it's followed, then um, then everyone would be happy. You know? If developers will will, will get, get in touch with archaeologists earlier on, rather than the end of their projects. You know? If uh, if uh, uh, developers of of Art Deco buildings you know, really earnestly sit down with heritage architects early on and and find the best way to approach it, you know, and then. There's no reason why uh, they will lose money. Mm. It will be more expensive, definitely, but that's just how it is. No? Okay. Uh, There's a related question from Jim Carl Kwasai Maasim. He's curious um, if a potential archaeological site is found inside a protected area, uh, uh, is an excavation or would an excavation be possible? Yes. Or allowed? 
Oh, yes. So in the old days, it was very straightforward. Um, the National Museum has a lot of uh, power you now in the spirit of law. Now we have a new laws and a lot of these uh, regulatory powers are moved to the NCCA. And so and the NCCA is still uh, learning it, you know, trying to get used to it. But the best approach in our experience is always to coordinate with the DNR and with the PAMB, you know, and uh, and if you uh, put on top of that, let's say it's a it's uh, it's a uh, indigenous people's uh, uh, territory, then you have to coordinate and um, uh, with the uh, indigenous people who are responsible for that area. It just becomes more complicated, but yes, it's possible, and sh and should be possible. Uh, from Jonathan Tendero Habana, uh, what could be measures from the state that you think uh, requires or is needed for the archaeological field today? I, I don't get it. What, what measure? I, I think he's saying that uh, wh why would uh, the state, uh, uh, what, what could be measures from the, the state? I, I think why would the state um, need archaeology. Ah, uh, well, put, oh. that's yes. Yeah. So, um, that's a good question. But if you look at the history of state formation, state making, it's uh, from the time of the new uh, old and the earliest example we know are the new Babylonians, no? Uh, and in um, Mesopotamia, where it was very clear to justify, to reinforce. Uh, their position. They needed, the deeper they can anchor their existence or their rational uh, to the past, the better. So it's a very, very old te uh, technique of, um, of ruling. No? But nation states, the nation states are, and, and it's across the board, every single nation state needed, needed to root itself to its uh, history. And that history is uh, best defined by the materiality of culture, because then it becomes um, all encompassing, inclusive, rather than based on a single ethnic linguistic group or based on a certain kind of ethnicity. And, and so archaeology has always been central there. And you will see this when you look at how early national museums were created in South America, in uh, even here in the Philippines, uh, and in across all uh, previous colonial um, um, of, um, of colonial domains, no? of, uh, of uh, that became independent by the uh, by the twentieth century. Of course, South America became independent by the early first quarter of the of the nineteenth century. Okay, Doc. Doc, I'm, I was just curious. The the examples you showed earlier, uh, most of the references to uh, publications which mm -hmm. uh, tied together um, the national narrative and its need for archaeology and history. Uh, there was a lot of that going on um, early after the war and especially during the Marcos period. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've not seen... Uh, refreshed or renewed publications uh, post Marcos, uh, or of course I might be wrong, but uh, uh, how was this uh, na national narrative or state narrative uh, panning out uh, post uh, since EDSA? It's, it's a good question. Since EDSA, the only really, the only, um, I, I could say if you, well, if you look at uh, the Kasai Science and Volume. Yes. No? Okay, that's your your post edsa. No? Then you can uh, you can also include there there the legislation that finally gave the three neoclassical buildings to the National Museum for for building. Then uh, prior to that, for for the centennial, they poured money to create the the, uh, the Museum of the Filipino People. 
which uh, at the core of it was the archaeological um, display. Publication wise, um, well, it was all centered in the National Museum, you know, the National Museum papers and everything. And so, yes, uh, it was just a scattering. But during martial law, the old, old man uh, Marcos was very deliberate in using, and he was really interested and deliberate in using archaeology to, to buttress, you know, to further um, articulate uh, the relevance and the righteousness of, of his new society. So that's different. No? So he was really very deep. Uh, uh, the man, like many of the, and I found out that since everyone was interested, uh, Quezon really was interested, but mm -hmm. the war happened. Uh, Makapagal went to Tabon Caves when Tabon Cave was discovered, the old man Makapagal, President Makapagal. And Marcos, of course, went to archaeological sites, no? uh, visited them, and then created presidential decrees. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there is a correlation, I think, between uh, between uh, strong men uh, or dictators and support for archaeology, because it's a it's uh, it's one of those um, disciplines that that uh, rulers or dictators or authoritarian um, rule uh, think believe is something that they can use. Okay. Doc, uh, uh, one, one uh, uh, final two questions. Um, there's a question here. Uh, uh, was the, briefly, was the uh, Novaliches archaeological site uh, fruitful? Yes, and still very important. And must be, uh, must be re-excavated. There's so much left there. So much left there. And it was protected, you see. So when the La Mesa Dam um, was built, uh, that was protected in many ways. So what by, since Bayer's time, there was only one and it was very far away. It was not as hard of where Bayer excavated. Uh, so that, that is still a very rich area for investigation. Okay. Um, no, 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 no last question. I, I, I think it was edited. Um, but um, a question of my own, Doc. Um, yun nga, Doc. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, at the center of um, what is now a unraveling uh, state narrative, maybe deliberate or not, uh, is the National Museum. Uh, of course, the, the exhibits uh, betray the, you know, the, the preferences, the, the uh, selection of... Uh, uh, what is to be displayed or, or presented as part of the of what is natural culture, national heritage? Do you find a deliberateness, uh, quote unquote, in uh, what is actually being done? Is uh, is there a national narrative or a state narrative uh, forming uh, within how how the National Museum or maybe later the NCCA, as they have uh, been transferred or given the powers to? You know, uh, that that informs or unravels or uh, establishes uh, a national narrative. Well, luckily none. <laughs> and the reason behind that, as I mentioned in my talk, is that there's no consensus as to how to present what proper periodization to use. So we're not there yet. No? So unlike the authoritarian years of Marcos. The Tadhana was the framework no? yes. okay. across the board. And yeah. um, oh. even though he, that was not his idea, I mean, the details of that, we all know that. But at least that, that was like no one, he can drive it through. But he lost steam and energy, luckily. In our case now, even in, in historiography and history, um, show, you will uh, get free periodization of Philippine history. You will get uh, three books. Uh, with periodization, you will get three periodization. And everyone knows that the tripartite, you know, the pre-colonial, colonial republic periodization is not enough. And that is just a political periodization. So we're still there. But the, the good news is that uh, organically historians and people who are 
pondering upon this question are, are, are earnestly working on, on getting into a kind of um, acceptable periodization. We will get there, but, uh, but the beauty of it then therefore, <laughs> it's pros and cons, because if you don't have that, then you don't have this kind of uh, forcing of something that is not uh, uh, defensible. No? Uh, via history or archaeology. So at least we, that's a good thing, no? if you ask me. Okay. So that's why, that's the problem in the National Museum now. How, how to represent the archaeology part? Now that, uh, because there's a dilemma with, with what periodization to use. How do you organize that information? So I think they have a dilemma at the moment. But I think if they, if they, solve that or, or they have a proposal, they, you know, exhibits are exhibits. It's easy to later on now uh, to revise that and change and tweak, you know, and that's the beauty of it. Okay, check it out. Uh, Doc, um, uh, before we end, uh, I'd like to ask you um, a, a, a word or two, a, a, any message for our listeners, for our audience this afternoon. Uh, those interested both in history and archaeology and their intertwined practice? Well, as the old curse goes, right? May you live in um, interesting times? Well, we live in interesting times in <laughs> many ways. Uh, <laughs> and the beauty of it, when we live in interesting times, is that we um, the questions are ab ab abound about the past and and, and uh, we are in a better place to answer many of the questions that were impossible to answer or even slightly address in the past. There are better tools, there are better frameworks, there are better uh, um, experienced people, uh, there are better networks. So there is uh, much hope uh, and promise uh, in the future. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the new generation of scholars, I'm talking about the totality of scholarship. Uh, and that totality, I think, is um, there's, there's much optimism to be, at, to be had, not to be, to be embraced. So I am an optimist. No? And um, uh, yes, you know, so, and we are, we, we meaning we at uh, the Archaeological Studies Program, in a, in a month, we will be formally transform into a school of archaeology. Yes. So we are now a school. Congratulations, Doc. Uh, after 27 years, I thought we would have been a school after 10 years. And it took 17 years late, no? but but that's just how it is because it's not, you know, it's something that you, you cannot really predict. But uh, so the key there is to, to create more programs, schools across uh, the Philippines to generate more individuals who are interested and um, and then to create parallel tracks of scholarship and that is the other import, important thing um, to have more public intellectuals that are not based in universities uh, the beauty of the 21st century access to data is uh, democratized so as long as you have the tools of analysis at hand and you can discourse within uh, the specialist discourse, doesn't matter if you're university-based or not. It, the proof of the pudding, as they say, will be uh, the product of uh, your writing, you know, your ideas, articulation of ideas. Yeah, so that's, that's how it is. More than a word, though. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Uh, most inspiring and most encouraging. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, that that closes our question and answer portion. Um, should anyone uh, from the audience require e certificates, uh, please do uh, uh, send us an email or a comment. Uh, we will be sending you uh, an evaluation uh, before we provide them. Uh, I'd like to turn over again the virtual floor. Virtual floor, na naman doc. To Miss Cora for her concluding remarks. Congratulations, Dr. Paz. After 27 years, patience, and it indeed it helps that you are an optimistic person. 
and your last words um, prod us to think. I, I mulled just now the, that there should be more public intellectuals and that for me, there should be more research and, in, and indeed you gave us more than just a word. So uh, thank you very much for that. Educative, intellectually inspiriting is yes, a presentation that is so animated and alive in two disciplines related to the past. It has not been an uncommon query. Do archeology span and history intersect? Usually asked to provoke. Do they support one another's research results? And thank you for elucidating that indeed history is more than reading of records and texts and how chronology is vital in both disciplines. And for answering the questions offered by our audience, those questions and active engagement demonstrate how the audience Students, cultural advocates, our own uh, trustees are earnestly interested, thirsty in your words, in updated history and narratives that might help us better understand ourselves, where we are, who we are. Maraming salamat, Dr. Paz. Pwede bang pang-apat? You said that this is your third uh, talk with us, and we are hoping that we could ask you for a fourth and a fifth and a sixth engagement, hopefully. To our participants, followers, friends, we hope to see you next month for the last lecture of Muscat's 2022 season. Muscat maintains its efforts in safeguarding and celebrating Philippine culture. Be our partner in championing our heritage. For announcements, we are on Facebook and Instagram. We are also on YouTube and Spotify. Do like us. Maraming salamat at magandang hapon sa kanilang lahat. Hanggang sa susunod na buwan at kabanata ng aming lecture series 2022. Ingat po.